Well, good morning, Eagle Heights. I'm so glad you are here. As the lights are coming up a little bit more, we love you and we thank you for being here. Get your notes out. If if you don't have them, they're on the back of the bulletin. And we're going to be looking at the We Three Kings. But I need you to understand something. Much of what we know or we think we know about the kings actually comes from tradition and it's not biblical. And we need to make this important distinction for a reason. If if it's not important to the story, there's no reason to talk about it. But if we keep just the tradition, the impact of the story is lost. Let me give you an example. Uh, I love the imagery here, and there's nothing wrong with this. First off, we're not going to start canceling stuff. We're in cancel culture. Keep the song going, baby. It's a great song. I love it. We're trying to encapsulate the entire story in songs. But tradition says we have three wise men. Now, now, here's the reality. The Bible's plural. There could have been three wise men. It doesn't say a magi. It says the magi. But there could have been 300. There could have been two. We stick with three because of the three gifts that were given. But we actually don't know how the three were here. Uh, We also have had tradition that these come from the lines of Noah. Meaning each one of these is a representative of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, his sons which means they're a reflection of all humanity. And actually, they've been given names, which is crazy. We don't know their names. Caspar, Balth- Balth- uh, Balthazar, and Melchior. Or Mel- I can never say that last name. It's not a real name, and it wasn't a real person. I was actually watching a Christmas movie the other day, and, and the guy had three wise men in his, in his lawn, and one got knocked over, and he picked it up and goes, oh, Balthazar, oh, Balthazar. And, and it's even in our Christmas stories. But here's the reality. This isn't accurate. It's tradition. Is it okay if we do this? Absolutely. Don't change it. It's part of the Christmas story. We're not going to cancel the song. I just want us to see something very important because once you see what's actually happened historically, it's going to make the power of the story more impactful. So let's read Matthew 2. This is probably a very famous section or uh, very uh, familiar. So Matthew chapter 2 uh, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says 12. I probably sent that wrong to our tech team. That's probably my fault. Guys, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I, I should be, I'll be more car- careful next week. Uh, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Remember, we saw troubled in every Christmas story. Mary's heart was troubled. We saw last week, we saw that the heart was troubled. This week, with the disciples, this week we see the heart being troubled again. It was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him when he had called together all the people, people's chief priests and teachers of the law. He asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is, well, this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child was with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and and frankincense, or it's a form of incense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, we have to be honest, the Magi are the most mysterious part of the Christmas story. All of a sudden, we're seeing angels appear to Mary. We see angels appear to shepherds. And then, all of a sudden, in Jerusalem, these magi show up. Now, we don't know who they are. We only know they come from the east. But we need to understand the little context here. If three dudes are riding into Jerusalem on camels, that's not going to interrupt, bother anybody. Period. That's not going to upset a soul. That's a common occurrence. But they didn't arrive with just three people. So you must understand, they're coming from Babylon. We'll see about that in just a second. 
They've traveled most likely 1,700 miles. It would have taken them months to get there. Three to six to nine months. And they didn't travel alone. They had an entourage. They come with a small army. They come with servants. They come with food wagons. They come with a, with a, with a gold wagon bearing the gifts. They come with everything. So this isn't just a simple three guys trotting into Jerusalem. This is dignitaries from another country riding into town. Now you're going to understand in just a minute as we get further into the Magi, why this was so troubling. And then they show up and they ask a question. Now that would in, that would in and of itself would trouble Israel because you have foreign dignitaries coming in unannounced. But then they ask one question that threw the town into in complete and total trouble. We're looking for the one who is born king of the Jews. Now that's important because this story isn't about the Magi, it's about two kings. See, there were two kings, not three. There were two kings, not three. See, the arrival of the Magi begins an introduction of a second king. The arrival of the Magi, or the appearance of the Magi, begins to bring about the reality of a second king. King Herod was the king of the Jews, but these guys show up and start saying, wait a minute, there's a second king. So we need to understand why they're even asking this question. How did they get from Babylon to Jerusalem? How are these guys even part of this story and why? Well, we need to understand the tradition surrounding the Magi. We've already looked at a little bit of it, but let's just take it from the psalm. We've already said that there were three kings. This story's not about them. They're not kings. They're magi. That's what they are. They're not kings at all. There's only two kings, King Jesus and King Herod, that are involved in this story. And it says, we three kings of Orient are. They're not from the Orient. They're not from that area in an Asian peninsula. They're actually from the country of, of Parthia, that's ruling at that time, and it's center in Babylon. We're going to see more about that in a minute. So these men are not what we think they are. We need to understand who they are. So much of the traditions are wrong. So let's get to the truth concerning the Magi. Let's look at the truth concerning the Magi. First off, I need you to understand, we we don't know a lot about them. Because this is the only place in the New Testament, Matthew is the only one that talks about it. Once they leave, we don't see them again in the entire New Testament. So we have to go back to the Old Testament to actually discover something about them. And the place that's best to discover them is actually in the book of Daniel. Do you guys remember what happened in the book of Daniel? Daniel had been taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. He had come in and they had captured all of Jerusalem. And they took the best and the brightest back to, to Babylon to train them to serve in the king's court. Well, in the king's court, there was a group of men called Magi, and they were part Mede and part Persian. They were the priests of the Medes. That's who they were. Now, you need to understand something. Our word magic, the word we use magic, actually comes from Magi because of their practices. They were practiced, they practiced the occult. They were practitioners of sorcery, of witchcraft, of astrology, and divination of dreams. So when we think of magic, we think of a kid in a big top hat. I'm talking the dark arts here. They mastered those. They understood those. They taught those. But we also get another word from the word magi. Other than magic, we get the word magistrate. Now back in the ancient world, superstition and science weren't separated. They were brought together. So not only were these guys masters of astrology, but they were masters of astronomy. And you couldn't separate them. So, magi would have been philosophers, scientists, mathematicians, astronomers, and legal advisors. That's who they were. They were very powerful in the rule of Babylon. Now, here's the crazy thing. No Persian king could take the throne until he mastered the teachings of the magi. Why is that so important? Do you guys remember in the story of Daniel and in the story of Esther, how that in both stories, there were edicts set down by the king that were set according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which meant it was an unbreakable law. Well, the law of the Medes and the Persians were the teachings of the Magi. 
It was the legal teachings of the Magi. They set the legal codes in the nation of Babylon and in this country. So we understand something. In the Old Testament, these men are incredibly powerful men. But how do we get Old Testament magicians and magistrates from ancient Babylon several thousand years later, they're showing up in Jerusalem? Well, it goes back to the story of Daniel. See, when Daniel had been taken captive, he was being trained in what? All these arts. Well, Daniel was a man who would not compromise his faith in God. And if you remember, Daniel in the chapters 1 and 2 aren't doing that. But in chapter 2, something crazy happens. The king has this wild dream, but he can't remember it. Have you ever had one of those mornings you wake up and go, I know I had a weird dream, and I know I was wearing... I was wearing swim fins in the mall, and I was dancing in the fountain at the mall. Are there fountains in malls anymore? I think I just ruined my own illustration. But anyway, I was dancing in the fountain at the mall, but I don't remember anything else. If you had a dream like that, well, that's what the king had. He couldn't remember it. So he calls all his magi, and he goes, gentlemen, I've had this dream. I need you to interpret it. They go, great, tell us the dream, O king, and we'll interpret it. He goes, there's a problem. I don't remember my dream. I need you to tell me the dream as well. And they're all just like, have you ever heard that point where the, the record scratches? That's what happened. They go, uh, oh, king, tell us the dream. We'll interpret it. He goes, no, 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 you got to tell me the dream. <laughs> they go, king, nobody can do that. He goes, all right, I want all of the magi killed. Well, that included Daniel and his three friends. So Daniel goes to his handler and he says, hey, listen, <clears throat> give me three days. And let me see if my God can inter- tell me the dream and interpret it. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. God gave him the dream and he interpreted it. And when that happened, this is the king's response. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him. He became the prime minister of Babylon. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its, say it with me, wise men. Say it again, wise men. Guess who that is? Magi. If you study the stories of Daniel, and if you continue to look past chapter 6, chapter 6 is his life, from 1 to 6, it's his life in, in Babylon in captivity. But from 7 to the end of the chapter to 12, it's his prophecies. And in chapter 9, we know something. Daniel began to prophesy about the arrival of the Messiah. Now, he's over these wise men. We absolutely know the character of Daniel. And it's honestly believed that he consistently poured into them all of the truth in these prophecies. So these men would have had this handed down knowing that there was a baby to be born in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And he would be the Messiah, the King of the Jews. So we know that that's most likely where these men arrived. But notice something, we're not in the Old Testament, we're in the New Testament. So why is this causing all this trouble? Why is this causing all this trouble? trouble. Well, believe it or not, in the first century, the Magi were still men of incredible power and influence. But listen to this. We've always been told that Rome ruled the world. They did for a long time, but not all of it. See, they conquered modern day Europe. In first century, they went west of Jerusalem and conquered. And they they, they possessed Israel, but they didn't go east. East of, Jer- east of Israel, it was a nation called Parthia. And the Parthians conquered on the east side. And they had many battles along that line, many in Israel, many in that surrounding area. But Rome never defeated Parthia at all. Now let's put the story in context. Riding into Jerusalem is a Parthian army. We don't know how many. It could have been 50 men. It could have been 100 men. Riding ahead of them is the Magi. Now, why is this important? Well, at this point in time, the Magi were part of the crowning of a king. They're kingmakers. And all of a sudden, the kingmakers from the enemy nation is riding into Roman territory and asking, where is the one born king of the Jews? They're not asking for Herod. They're asking for another king. As you can imagine, that absolutely caused the trouble and the anxiousness to rise to the highest level 
possible. And we know Herod took this very seriously. Because what he asked, hey, when you worship that king and you find him, bring him to me, and I'll go worship him too. But the, God told him to leave a different direction. And then what was Herod's response? Well, you read on in the chapter, he orders the babies, to, the male babies, two and under, to be slaughtered in Bethlehem. He's threatened, and he doesn't want this king to take the throne. He legitimately saw this as a threat to his reign. So the appearance of the Magi caused all kinds of trouble. But let's look at the arrival of the Magi when they actually get to where they see Jesus. When they get to see Jesus. Now the question becomes is, we see them following the star. And I'm not going to go, we see the star in the design here. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. That's a whole different message. But I don't believe the star is a natural phenomenon at all. I believe it's a supernatural phenomenon. Matthew kind of hints at that. Because the star is not acting like a planetary object. It's leading and it's moving. The only place we see this in the whole Old Testament or in the Bible is when the Shekinah glory of God is leading Israel. We see him as a cloud by day and we see him as a pillar of fire by night. I believe this is some form. God is communicating this. So why would that be important? Why would they look for a star? These guys studied prophecy. Daniel saw to it. They would have gotten this from Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but he's not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. It's a reference, to, it's a prophecy, part of the prophecy of the birth of Jesus. So they're looking for this star, and there it rises, and they follow it, and it leads them. I believe it was God's direction, God's supernatural action. If you have a problem with supernatural events, I understand, but if God is who he says he is, supernatural events are nothing for God. So they followed this star, but they came to do something. Look what it says. When they get to Bethlehem and they make the search, they find him. And when they saw them, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Now understand something. This is important. Their reaction shows their commitment and conversion to Christ. Because the word worship means homage. Now, what's the difference between private worship and homage? Homage is public worship. It's for everyone to see. Public worship, where I declare my submission, I declare my love, I declare that person's greatness. But believe it or not, do you know the example that is best used to describe worship? It's actually the example of a Persian worship. When Persian uh, men of military, sta- uh, military rank or social status meet each other and they're equal, they kiss each other on the cheek. That's where that came from. It's a sign of equality. It's a sign of respect. But when you are in the presence of someone who is higher rank than you, you would immediately fall to your knees. You would bow your head to the ground and you would blow kisses to them. And here's what you're saying to them. You are greater than I. You are, you are, there's none like you, and I submit myself to you. But I want you to see the picture here, guys. Don't miss this. In the Old Testament, Israel was taken to Babylon and forced to bow before a foreign king. And now, Babylon is bowing before the king of kings. God brought full circle what had taken place. And these men are here giving worship to Christ, bowing before Him, saying, I surrender, I submit, I am yours. And then they brought the gifts. We see it, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold was a gift to a king. And it wouldn't just be a little bit. It would have been enough that when Mary and Joseph leave and flee to Egypt because of Herod, they lived on it for two years. So this is a lot of gold. But then they also brought something called frankincense. Now, what was that? It was an odorous gum that was harvested from trees, and they placed it in the burnt offering so it would become a sweet aroma to God. But then they brought myrrh. You don't bring myrrh to a baby shower at all. You know what it's for? Embalming. That's like someone coming to you and saying, hey, I love your baby. I've picked out a casket for your child. Would you like pink or would you like blue? You're going to slap that person. That's the dumbest gift you'd ever bring a baby. So why are they bringing myrrh? Because each one is a picture of his deity. The gold is he is the king of kings. He is the rightful king of the Jews. His, his, the frankincense shows that he is God, that sweet aroma. And they're worshiping him as God. 
And that myrrh shows the sacrifice that Jesus Christ came to make. It's a picture of what he's going to do on behalf of all of us. But then we know they leave. But here's the incredible part of the story. The incredible part of the story is there's one true king, and we see three responses to the one king. We see three responses to the true king. Notice the very first one, and this one baffles me. It's indifference. Notice what happens. King Herod calls his wise men, or he calls the chief priests and the teachers of the law in verse 4, and he asked them, where is the Christ to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. And then they quote Micah 5 too. Now stop right there. The, the Sadducees, or the Pharisees, and the scribes, especially the scribes, were experts in the law. Do you know what the scribes did all day? They copied the law. They would take it and they would meticulously, word by word, line by line, verse by verse, copy it exactly as it should be copied so it would be preserved. They were experts. They were the professional teachers. They were the professors of their day. So when they call him in and he says, hey, I need to know where the Messiah is to be born. Man, this is Bible trivia 101 for these guys. They go, oh, king, thank you for asking. Uh, what is Micah 5.2? And it's almost like it's jeopardy for them. I bet 500, King Herod. And it's, guess what? It's, you know, what is, what is Bethlehem? But then notice what they do. They leave. Now think about that. These guys know the Old Testament. They know the prophecies of the Messiah. They've been waiting on the Messiah. They've been listening for the Messiah, looking for the Messiah. And all of a sudden, we have the announcement of the Messiah and nobody cares. Such an illogical response. You mean not one of these guys is going to jump on a donkey or borrow a chariot and go the five miles to Bethlehem to find out? Nobody? They are completely indifferent to the birth of the king. I'm beginning to see that in the church today. In a lot of people who call themselves believers, they, they know they claim Christ, and, and they know a lot about Christ. They know more about Christ than a lot of people do, maybe more than most. But it's almost like the responses I've received from him what I want. But I really don't want him. I want what he gives. I, I, I'm okay to possess his gift. I'm okay to believe in his promises. I'm okay to tip my hat to him at church every now and then or these other issues. But I'm not going to seek him. I don't really want a relationship with Christ. See, what I want is I want him to take care of my future and take control of my future but I don't want him interrupting my everyday life. John the Baptist had a, a verse for those people. Matthew 3, 12. Jesus is ready to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's talking about those who appear to be believers and those actually are believers. And it's when they would separate them on the grain floor. They'd take a winnowing fork and throw it in the air and the wind would blow the fake chaff away those who weren't believers or that which appeared to be true but wasn't and got blown off and then the actual wheat would fall down because it was heavier than the weed. The wheat from his chaff with Jesus, Jesus is ready to separate the wheat from the chaff with his winnowing fork. He's going to gather the wheat in the barn and the chaff with never ending punishment. Let me ask you a question, believer. How indifferent are you to Christ? I mean, let's be honest. You claim Him to be Lord, and your response to Him is indifference. You know what that tells me? You've never looked closely. You've never looked continuously. And you know very little about Jesus Christ. See, indifference is an illogical response. The next response, though, makes sense to me. Hostility. Hostility makes sense. We see King Herod showing this incredible hostility. Guys, I want you to see something. I'm seeing a rise in hostility in the United States against Christianity. I listened the other day to uh, James Carville, who was on Bill Maher, and he said the greatest threat to Christianity or to the U.S. today is Christian nationalism. 
But then he went on to define Christian nationalism as the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson's faith. Mike Johnson's a believer in the Bible. Mike Johnson tries to follow the Bible. That's what he believes. Biblical Christianity is what he follows. I may not agree with all of his convictions, but the basis is the same. I'm seeing a hostility coming from new atheists like Richard Dawkins who are writing books just to just try to, to obliterate Christianity. But here's my point. Why? Why? If God isn't real and Jesus isn't the Son of God, what's the difference? Why such hostility? Because if you're an atheist, you believe after this, we're not going to exist. This is it. So nothing we really do matters. Let's be honest. Atheism is about tearing things down. It's not about giving hope. It just attacks everyone else. And it puts you in a position where you can do whatever you want because you are the source of truth. But if that's true, then why do you care what I believe? I mean, the faith of atheism, you're the source of truth. Now you can go into the community, gets to define all that, but let's be honest, that's, look at the community. Whoo! You're going to have to accept everything, and most of it's probably going to disagree with what you believe. So what's the, what's the hostility? Why is there such hostility? I believe it's for one reason. A person attacks that which is a real threat to their way of thinking or living. Jesus is a threat to anyone who thinks seriously about him. He declares himself to be Lord, which automatically means if that's true, I am now dethroned. I'm not the one who gets to choose the direction of my life. He does. If Jesus said he, who he said he is, he is creator. That means he possesses me and everything. If Jesus who he said he is, he means he's savior, which automatically means I need to be saved, which also means I am what? A sinner. I'm separated from God at birth. Well, Brad, if I just do enough good, you know what, guys? I'm going to give you a realization. You can do enough good. Let's say we all do enough good and we actually attain utopia. Guess what's going to happen? We're all going to end up separated from God, paying for our own sins in eternity forever. Because it's not about good and bad. It's about being born separated from God with a sin nature. You can do as much good as you want to do. But by nature, guess what? We do not want God to be the Lord. We want to be the Lord. We refuse it. We're hostile toward it. We reject it. See, if Jesus is who he says he is, it demands a response. You either believe it and you bow and you follow and you love, or you reject, you are hostile, you hate him, and you do everything you can to tear him down and those who believe it and reject everything he says. But why? I don't see anybody doing this with Buddhism, anything else, any other religion, just Christianity. Why is that? Every other religion has to deal with Jesus. Christianity doesn't have to deal with every other religion. <laughs> See, I don't have to explain Buddha. I don't have to explain Allah. But they have to explain Jesus. Why is that? The truth of the matter is hostility makes sense since He is God and we are not. Indifference is illogical. It really is to me. Hostility does make sense. I just refuse to acknowledge him as Lord. I don't, I, he's not king. That doesn't make him not king. That makes you responsible for your own life. Now I need to say to you, if you hold that position to be true, the end result is you face that king. Why? He is, if he is Lord and he is creator and he is savior, you have to give an account for those three things. Whether you like that or not, whether you agree with that or not, that's, if it is true, and let me give you an example. When any of the new atheists are asked, what if you're wrong? They immediately turn the table, begin to attack people and tell them about all these different religions and they never answer the question. Because here's the answer. 
If you're wrong, you're going to pay for your own sins with your own life. If you're right, you just cease to exist. Let me tell you a logical conclusion to that. If Jesus is not God, we're good. Aren't we? I can tell you what Christianity's done for me. It has changed my life. I have been able to help people, serve people, love people in a community of faith and family like this one. You guys, you know what's great about Eagle Heights? We don't care about branding. We don't care about being big. We don't care about all these impressive things. We just want to be a family and a place of grace that just takes people as they are. That's all we want to be. And no matter what God does, that's who we're going to remain. Our dynamic in that, our purpose, our, di- our, our direction will not change. That defines us. I've been married to the same woman next year for 33, 33 years. I've had a great marriage, a great partner, a loving wife. We were laughing on the way to church today. It was so hilarious. Christy's coffee cup spilt. She got something hung up in her, her clothing. And I mean, everything's just attacking her in the car. And she goes, dear Lord, what's going on today? And she said, and she, she's praying. It really was just a hubris. She's like, God, please just let me keep my sanity today. And I'm like, it's like we're living in a Disney movie and all the furniture's come to life. And we're just laughing on the way to church. God's given me an incredible sons and beautiful daughters-in-law. They've given me wonderful grandchildren. I have to be part of this body, this family. I've been here 17 years. I've got to see your children grow up. I've got to see your children, some of them starting to get married. Hey, I'm I'm watching some of them start to date. I'm sorry I brought that up. I really am. I've got to see some of them leave home and go to college and serve the Lord. I've got to feed the homeless, teach the illiterate to read. I've got to make a betterment in society. So if, if, if Christianity is wrong, let me tell you something right now. I've had a fabulous life. And if I had a choice to do it again, knowing Christianity was wrong, I would still want what it has provided me. Completely. So if it's wrong, I'm still good, aren't I? But if atheism and other beliefs are wrong, The outcome is very clear. You get to stand before this king, your creator, and ask himself, why did I not worship? See, that's what the wise men did. They worshiped. That's the final response. To come and say, you are king. I bow before you because there is no other king like you. There is no other God. There is no other way. There is no other source of life. And I'm here to surrender to you. Submit to you. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus your king? Because that's the story of the wise men. Is he your king? Has there been a moment in your life where you have knelt before him, you've admitted one thing, he is God and I am not. He's the only way I can be saved, and and there's no other. And you've bowed before him and said, I repent to you because you are God, the king. You are the creator, and you own everything, and you are savior overall. And I'm asking you to save me. Have you ever had that moment? If you haven't, you can have it right now. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, just repeat after me. Now this, and let me tell you something, this prayer does not save you. It's faith that saves you. It's a really simple prayer. I'm just helping you express your faith to God and making him your king. Just say this, say, dear Jesus, I admit you're the king of kings. I admit there is no other God. And because of that, there is no other way. So I'm putting my faith completely, solely, and totally in you. Just like the wise men bowed before you and submitted themselves to you. I'm submitting to you. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. I receive that. Thank you. 
Now, this is the season of giving. So right now, if you just pray to me, I want you to give Him praise. Just praise Him. If you want to sing We Three Kings to Him right now, just you and Him sing it. But I want to talk to the believers in this room, those who know they're a believer. I'm going to ask you a question. You say He's your King, but are you indifferent to your King? Are you holding on to promises, but you don't want Him interrupting your day? He has access to your future, but nothing else. I don't want Him. I want what you got. If that's you, you need to bow before Him and repent. Your indifference is illogical. Some of you need to ask yourself seriously, how could you come to the King of Kings and be indifferent to who He is? If that's you, you need to ask yourself, is this sin? Is this pride? Is this selfishness? Or is this the fact that I really don't know Him? Some of you as believers just need to come and say, Brad, you know what? I've just been neglectful. I've gotten so busy in the things around me, I've just ignored the king. Well, you need to give him the same thing today. Worship. By rebowing. It's not about getting saved again. It's about coming and admitting, I've ignored you. And I'm here to submit If you're lost, you need to surrender. If you're saved, you need to submit again and say, God, you are a king, and I want you to be king of not just my future, but today. Believers, take a moment. Just pray that. Talk to God about it. Father, thank you. We love you. We praise you. There are Christians praying. There's there's people who are now believers praying. There's other people who are just wrestling with all this. God, and that's okay. We love that, God. And not that they're wrestling, but that, that literally, God, you're opening their eyes and you're softening their heart and you're making them think. And that's okay. You, you invite us to look closely. You want us to take you seriously. Christianity is not some surface religion that you just believe in and walk away. It's a call to look deep It's a call to dive deep. It's a call to look and ask hard questions. And that's okay, God. For those who are asking, direct them. For those who are believing, Lord, assure them of the one true fact they're now your child. For believers who are submitting, I pray the joy of their salvation will return. But all of us, let us end in worshiping you and giving you praise. Thank you, Father. And all Eagle Heights said, Amen.